Chat with uh, the wife of the Vice President Hajia Samira Baumia, former President Rawlins, the first President of the First Republic, together with his spouse Nana Kunidu Ajima Rawlins, and there will be the national anthem now. At this point, the right honorable speaker is proceeding to the central lobby to receive the president and his vice as uh, he has now brought them in. 
and soon honorable members of parliament and other distinguished guests will resume their seats. Honorable members, we are honored to have in the house His Excellency Nana Adodankwa Ikufu Adi, President of the Republic of Ghana and Commander in Chief of the Ghana Armed Forces, together with his wife, Mrs. Rebecca Egufu Ado. We also receive with great pleasure His Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic, Dr. Mahamudu Baumia, and his wife, Mrs. Samira Baumia. May I also acknowledge the presence of my Lord, the Chief Justice, Ms. Sophia Akufu, and other justices of the Superior Court of Judicator of the Republic. The former President, Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rollins, and his wife, Mrs. Nana Kunedu Ajimon Rollins. The former President of the Republic, His Excellency, President John Muhammad. The chairman and council members of the Council of State. Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps. Traditional and religious leaders, eminent citizens of our country. My wife, Alberta. Leaders of all political parties in the Republic. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, here present. 
Honorable members, His Excellency, the President, is in the House this morning in accordance with Article 67 of the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana to deliver his message on the state of the nation. On behalf of the leadership, honorable members and officers of this house, it is my singular honor to welcome His Excellency, the President, to this house. And now, I respectfully invite His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Ado Dankwa Ekufu Ado, to deliver his message on the state of our nation. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, glad to be here with you again in this august house, the Parliament of our Republic, to perform for the third time the pleasant duty of fulfilling my constitutional obligation by giving honorable members and the Ghanaian people a message on the state of the nation. In accordance with protocol and convention, it's good to see the First Lady Rebecca Kufu Adam, Vice President Mohamedou Bawumir, Second Lady Samira Bawumir, Spouse of Mr. Speaker, Mrs. Alberta Okwe, Chief Justice Sophia Akufu, and Justices of the Supreme Court, Chairperson Nana Utu Simbo II, and members of the Council of State, Chief of Defense Staff, Lieutenant General Obi Aqua, Inspector General of Police David Asante and Pietro, and Service Chiefs are all present. Speaker, the House is duly honored by the welcome attendance of the former Presidents of the Republic, the first and fourth Presidents of the Fourth Republic, the Excellences Jerry John Rawlins and John Dramani Mahama. Former First Lady, Her Excellency Nana Konedu Ajiman Rawlins, and the Dean and members of the Diplomatic Corps. Mr. Speaker, the House will also take note of the passing last year of some distinguished citizens of our country Vice President Kwesi Bakwe Anissa Arthur, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, Senior Minister J.H. Manson. Justice of the Supreme and the Poet Laureate, Professor Atukwe Oke. May their souls rest and abide in the bosom of the Almighty until the last day of the resurrection, when we shall all meet again. Amen. Amen. Speaker, I hope the House will bear with me, as I have a lot to say, and I may take quite some time. <laughs> a month ago, Almost to the day, I was in Yindi, fittingly attired as a self-proclaimed Prince of Dagon, yeah. Prince Abudani, yeah. the first of that lineage, yeah. to witness the installation of Yana Mahamna Abukari II as the overlord of Dagbon. Thousands of our compatriots were there to share in the joy of the occasion. It was a ceremony that many had despaired we would ever see. But a new Yana, accepted by the two gates of Abudu and Andani, was installed on that day. It brought to an end decades of feuding that laid low the proud and ancient kingdom of Dagbon. It was a happy day, and it marked the climax of a long, tortuous journey and a hard grind on the part of many people through the years. 
Two years ago, when I had the honor to become president of our country, I decided to summon all the resources of the state and my own energies and make a concerted effort through the dedicated patriotic committee of MNNTs that had been working on the problem for the last 17 years to find an acceptable solution. With the blessings of the Almighty, we had a breakthrough and this led to the month-long series of events that will climax in the installation on 21st January 2019. Mr. Speaker, I was not looking to be accorded any special title or accolade, and I was certainly not looking for praise. I did want to do whatever I could to make sure that this long-running soul that was such a blight on Dagon and Ghana and which dragged down the development process in our country could be resolved and we could move on. We spent enough emotional stress, enough time, enough energy, and enough money on the Dagon dispute. I wanted that amount of emotion, that time, that energy, and that money to be spent on trying to make Dagon and Ghana prosperous. I'm grateful for the hard work and wisdom of the eminent chiefs, the two four say to two the second, the Santehene, the Nairi, Nabuhugu Abdullah Mahami Sheriga, overlord of Mamprugu, and the Yabongura, Tutumba Boresa Sulemana Jakwa, overlord of the Ganja State, all of whom I salute, and for the support of many people in this house on both sides. And I pray that we all continue to build on this achievement and midwife the process until peace becomes part of the fabric of Dagon. The Minister for Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs intends to use the momentum of the Dagon settlement to tackle the other protracted chieftaincy disputes in the country, hopefully, for resolution. The Speaker, in order to reinforce and support the process of reconciliation and the restoration of peace in Dagon, I have decided that this year, the official 62nd Independence Day celebration will be held in Tamale on 6th March. Yay! This will be the first time in our nation's history that the celebration is being held outside of our national capital of Accra. And I'm very much looking forward to it. Mr. Speaker, this past week, the grounds of Jubilee House, the seat of our nation's presidency, have resounded to a lot of celebrations as we mark the handing over ceremonies of the constitutional instruments to the six new regions in our country. It has taken 18 months of very hard work and very complicated maneuvering to get to where we are today. Again, the requests and agitations for creation of new regions have been long-standing, and we have somehow never got around to dealing with them. Mr. Speaker, it was time to deal with these outstanding issues so that we could go ahead with the business of developing our country. The creation of the six new regions opens up the country and ensures that no one feels cut off from the center. Mr. Speaker, no corner of this country is being left behind. It is for this reason that we have created the three development authorities. It is for this reason that we have realigned the national budget to ensure that every constituency gets to see the equivalent of $1 million a year for priority projects. I'm it, Mr. Speaker, I'm able to state and every member of this house should be able to testify that work is going on in each of the 275 constituencies around the country. The water and toilet provision segment of the Special Development Initiative is taking place in every constituency. We came into office with a plan, Mr. Speaker. And I'm happy to say that we're working and delivering in accordance with that plan. Mr. Speaker, now that the regions are in place, 
we have the singular opportunity to avoid the old mistakes of urban planning that have made some of our towns and cities such unattractive places. The lessons will seem to show that the political capital does not necessarily have to be the site of all the institutions, and this will guide us in the setting up of the new regions. Indeed, when designating the capitals of the new regions at the ceremonies at Jubilee House last week, I made it clear the government is committed to the equitable distribution of government structures and institutions across the regions. We will keep to the commitment. Mr. Speaker, we have also embarked on another aspect of our ambitious decentralization program. That is the exercise to expand full democracy to local government. In addition to the creation of 38 municipal and district assemblies, and the elevation of 29 districts to the status of municipalities. The bill for the amendment of Article 55.3 of the Constitution has been gazetted to pave way for the direct popular election on partisan basis of metropolitan, municipal, and district chief executives. It is expected that a referendum will be held on the bill alongside the unit assembly and district level elections in 2019. I am calling respectfully, Mr. Speaker, for a repetition of the bipartisan support that made possible the hugely successful outcomes in the referendum for the new regions to ensure the success of the impending referendum. Furthermore, a multidisciplinary panel of ex experts is being assembled to plan, cost schedule, and help implement a roadmap for the election of MMDCEs. We are committed to devolving more and more power to the Ghanaian people. Mr. Speaker, the economy is at the heart of all we seek to do. It is the success of the economy that will guarantee an improvement in the quality of the life of our people. I believe we are now all agreed that the fundamentals have to be sound if the economy is to flourish. We have just concluded a program with the IMF, and with continuing discipline, we shall sign off from the deal in April. This is the 16th time Ghana has had to go to the IMF in the 62 years of her independence. Mr. Speaker, we cannot make the progress we all desire unless we are consistent and disciplined in the management of our economy. The yo-yo nature of the boom and bust has not helped us achieve our goal of sustained prosperity and lift us out of poverty. We have gone through another round of painful impositions to get to where we are today with healthy fundamentals. The speaker, production in the economy as measured by real GDP growth has picked up very strongly in the last two years. From 3.4% in 2016, real GDP growth increased to 8.1% in 2017. In 2018, provisional data for the first three quarters indicate a strong real GDP growth of 6%, higher than the annual target of 5.6%. Real GDP growth for 2019 is forecast at 7.6%. Ghana's recent GDP growth has placed it among the highest in the world. The fiscal deficit is being brought down from the 7.3 of rebased GDP in 2016 to a provisional 3.9% of GDP at the end of 2018. The debt to GDP ratio has declined from the 56.6% of GDP in 2016 to 54.8% at the end of 2018. Inflation has dropped from 15.4% at the end of 2016 to 9.9% in January this year, the lowest in six years, as announced by the Ghana Statistical Service last week. Interest rates are declining, and so is the Bank of Ghana monetary policy rate. Our trade balance account 
for the first time in more than a decade, recorded a surplus in 2017 and is expected to remain in surplus. In May 2018, a, a $2 billion euro bond was issued for 30 and 10 years of $1 billion each with coupon rates of 8.62% and 7.62% respectively. And these were the lowest rates and the longest maturity in our history, signifying confidence in the economy. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that today Ghana is the leading recipient of foreign direct investment in West Africa. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker these are good figures. And as we prepare to exit from the IMF program in April, we expect impressive figures and good performance to continue. We are very much aware that this is not the first time we have had such a good set of figures, but we're determined to do things differently this time around. We have imposed on ourselves fiscal discipline, we're paying off legacy debts, and deepening good governance practice and business confidence is growing. We will maintain the discipline and bring progress to our country. We've decided to institute a legal framework to help with the discipline. We've passed the Fiscal Responsibility Law, Act 9H2, capping the deficit at 5% by law. And some two weeks ago, I inaugurated the Presidential Fiscal Responsibility Advisory Council, chaired by the eminent respected economist, Dr. Paul Aqua, former governor of the Bank of Ghana and former deputy director of the African Department of the IMF, with some of the finest and most reputable economists of our country as members. Its purpose is to advise the president on relevant additional measures needed to maintain fiscal discipline. We have done this because we know the temptation to go on a spending binge will always be there. We know election years will come around and there will be pressure on government to splurge and persuasive arguments will be made that you have to stay in government to be able to implement your programs. However, I am bent on running a responsible administration mindful of the next generation and not merely the next election. In the meantime, our efforts are bearing some fruits and the world has taken notice of the improvement in our economic fundamentals. In September last year, after almost a decade, we received our first sovereign credit, credit rating upgrade from Standard & Poor's. S&P. This upgrade saw us move from B- minus to B with a stable outlook. In December 2018, we also hosted the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Madam Christine Lagarde, a visit that was historical in every sense, as this was the first time that an IMF Managing Director had ever stepped foot on Ghanaian soil. Mr. Speaker, revenue mobilization poses the biggest challenge in the management of our economy. With the tax exemption policy in particular, proving to be an Achilles heel and a growing menace to fiscal stability and revenue generation. In the last eight years, tax exemptions in respect of import duty, import VAT, import NHIL, and domestic VAT have grown from 392 million CDs, that is 0.6% of GDP in 2010, to 4.6 billion CDs, that is 1.6% of GDP in 2018. These figures do not include exemptions from the payment of corporate and individual income taxes, concessions on tax rates, petroleum tax reliefs, customs tax exemptions enjoyed by diplomatic missions and waiver of processing charges at the ports. If we continue at this rate, in less than 16 years, half of Ghana's revenue base will be given away as tax exemptions. Mr. Speaker, 
This is not sustainable. And we intend to do something about it to reverse the trend by introducing suitable measures that may disrupt the easy and comfortable arrangements that many have become accustomed to, but which we have to take to ensure that we have the firmest of foundations for the economic takeoff that has escaped us for so long. Speaker, workers in the public sector began the year on a good note after receiving a 10% increase in their salaries on top of the 11% increment of 2018. 41,000 workers in the informal sector were also enrolled onto Tier 3 pension schemes, with pensioners seeing an average increment of 11% in their monthly pension schemes, with the lowest income bracket receiving a 14.7% increment. Last year, the Youth Employment Agency, YEA, engaged some 107,000 youth in various employment modules, with an additional 125,000 set to be engaged this year. Mr. Speaker, to consolidate further the relations between the social partners in the post-IMF era, the government will shortly sign a landmark social partnership agreement with the Organized Labor, the Trades Union Congress, the Ghana Employers Association and government, represented by the Ministries of Finance, self-management, frank and open discussions to champion the course of development. Mr. Speaker, the fight against child labor has chalked some modest success. Through the implementation of the second plan, second phase of the National Action Plan of Action, 2017-2021, Ghana has been moved up from the Tier 2 watch list position of the Trafficking in Persons Report to Tier 2 in 2018. Mr. Speaker, our ports remain important national assets, and we must manage them to improve trade and to the benefit of all Ghanaians. The government has introduced, reforms, has introduced reforms at the import to improve efficiency. Among others, we introduced the paperless operations of the ports and goods can be cleared within one to three days. Going forward, we have set ourselves the goal of making our ports the most competitive in West Africa. In this regard, some further re reforms would soon be announced by government to enhance the competitive position of Ghana's ports and impact on the cost of living in our country. Ghana may be the toast of the world because of its economy. We've all accepted that these economic fundamentals are the foundation upon, our, upon which our people will become prosperous. But if they are uneducated or poorly educated, then prosperity will continue to elude them. To speak out, a sudden injection of oil revenue or a rise or fall in the price of gold or cocoa can make a dramatic difference to your financial situation. But there are no shortcuts to having an educated and skilled workforce. We have no choice but to provide our young people with quality education and lifelong learning opportunities for every Ghanaian. It is the only way to ensure prosperity and to protect our democracy. We are not sparing any efforts to make education in Ghana of the best quality and fit for the needs of the 21st century. In September 2019, a new standard-based curriculum will be rolled out from kindergarten to class six in primary schools. This curriculum has drawn upon the best practices from all over the world and will focus on making Ghanaian children confident, innovative, creative thinking, digitally illiterate, well-rounded patriotic citizens, mathematics, science, reading, writing, and creativity are therefore at the heart of this new curriculum. Mr. Speaker, poverty should not be an excuse for any Ghanaian child not to reach their fuel potential. It therefore warms my heart 
that we are now able to say that education in the public sector is free from kindergarten to senior high school, and that this year legislation will be passed to redefine basic education to include senior high school. Yeah. Young people have to have options on which career path they choose. And I'm glad to announce that all is set for the construction of 10 state-of-the-art technical and vocational education training centers this year. For far too long, we have preached about the importance of TVET without doing very much to demonstrate this importance. We send or urge young people to go to poorly equipped TVET centers and we're surprised that they are not keen. The new TVET centers will be world-class and attractive to assure young people that they are not being sent to second-best options. We're also bent on demystifying science, mathematics, and technology. Ten science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM centers are being built around the country to provide support for the introduction of STEM into basic education after the completion of a successful pilot phase. We can be sure, therefore, that Ghana's young people will be able to acquire skills that will put them at par with their peers anywhere in the world. The importance of science to innovation to advise the president on how to infuse the application of science and technology in the development of our nation, a council headed by distinguished scientist, Professor Edward Ayinsu. Speaker, we shall bring before Parliament this year a tertiary education policy bill that will bring all the public universities under a common law and make the administration of the public universities less cumbersome. Mr. Speaker, a well-motivated and remunerated teacher is at the center of our quality education and comprehensive teacher policy. This has started with the upgrading of the initial teacher education certificate to degree status and the move to put the teaching profession up there with other professions in terms of respect and exclusivity. Currently, many of our teachers who complete the three-year diploma in basic education at our colleges of education go on later to do a two-year top-up first degree by distance learning at the University of Cape Coast. This means that in addition to the extra amount of money spent on getting a degree, it will take them not less than five years to get one. With the introduction of the four-year Bachelor of Education degree, teacher trainees will now obtain their first degree at the end of their schooling. This ensures that they enter the teaching service as university graduates. Mr. Speaker, when our children master the connection between science and their everyday lives, we would reach the stage in Ghana where we would be rid of the many diseases born of filth and poor hygiene that are still part of our lives. In pursuing these goals, we need to remind ourselves rep repeatedly that health is wealth and it is only a healthy population that can make Ghana prosper. In May 2018, Ghana won accolades at the World Health Assembly for having eradicated trachoma, an eye disease that has plagued us for a long time. Today, our national health insurance scheme is buoyant. Government has paid up the 1.2 billion arrears we inherited and brought the operations of the NHIS back to life. On 19th December 2018, the introduction of mobile renewal of membership was launched. Since then, there have been on average 70,000 members renewing their membership every week by dialing star 929 hash on any mobile network. Soon, in collaboration with the National Identification Authority, Ghanaians will be able to register, renew, and access health care services using the Ghana card. 
We have to thank Dr. Samuel Arnold's brief but productive stewardship as CEO of the National Health Insurance Authority for that. I wish him well in his retirement. To deliver health care to Ghanaians more efficiently, in 2018, government granted financial clearance for the recruitment of 11,118 health personnel to increase existing clinical staff. To augment the efforts of clinical staff, in September 2018, the Ministry of Health received further financial clearance to employ 14,524 nurse assistants, clinical and preventive. These nurse assistants belong to the tranche that passed their exams in 2016 from We're dealing with it, and we will complete them. Ghana's hardworking nurses and doctors will do their best, as they have always done, to make sure we get the best health care. But it behoves on each one of us to look after ourselves better. Apart from exercising and taking our regular health checkups seriously, it is imperative that we eat healthy diets to prevent diseases that are caused by short choices of nutrition. <laughs> the speaker, when we're dealing with matters of good health, we must necessarily move on to shelter and housing. There is an acute shortage of user-friendly, decent housing for people in middle and low income brackets in our country. This is a long-standing problem that gets worse with each passing day. It is time to tackle the issue and find a resolution. We're starting with the completion of the many abundant projects dotted around the country. A consortium of local banks has raised $51 million to fund the completion of the social housing units started by the Kufu administration in 2006 at Kufuridua, Tamale, and Ho. The Saglemi housing project, started under the last NDC government, is also high on our list of priorities this year. The 5,000 units it offers would boost our housing numbers. We're therefore establishing the value for money issues surrounding the project in order to reconcile the number of houses built with the schedule of payments made and accelerate delivery. The 2019 budget made provision for the construction of 200,000 housing units and a database of local and foreign developers that has been created to help make this policy a reality. Land banks have also been secured in several towns across Ghana where factories producing prefabricated building materials can be sited for this huge construction effort. There are many well-intentioned projects that ended up pricing out the low-income earners who are supposed to be their beneficiaries. We're determined to learn the lessons from past projects. The Ministry of Finance is working to launch a one billion Ghana CD housing fund that would target low-income earners. Mr. Speaker, Government will continue with the other housing projects with the police, armed forces, and government workers across the country through agencies like the State Housing Corporation. The most exciting news on the housing landscape, landscape though, is the drafting of plans to regenerate NEMA, which holds the dubious title of being Accra's first slum. It has, of course, progressed very much since those early days even if it has been unable to shake off the urban slum title. I'm a proud resident of Nima myself. <laughs> and I'm extremely excited that the regeneration plans will not dislodge or dispossess residents, but rather transform Nima into a well laid out residential area with full amenities. I'm looking forward to it. Good work that is being done by the Ministries of Inner City and Zogo Development and Works and Housing. 
Another big problem is that of poor drainage in our towns and cities, which leads to flooding during the rainy season. Then there's a the serious problem of sea erosion along the coast that endangers the lives of our coastal people. It is time to deal with these long-term problems and find long-lasting solutions, and we're doing just that. The Odorna storm drains in Accra, which have caused many tragedies over the years, are now being re-engineered by a team of experts who will give it a permanent fix. The Dijamsu drain system is also a drainage system is also on our list of priorities, and a bid has been put out for experts to transform it into a more efficient system. Our ongoing coastal protection projects are proceeding in Ajoa in the western region, Lekusu, New Takradi Phase 2 in Almina, Dansoman, Axim, and Disco. This year, we'll also begin others in Amalfo Kuma, Dansoman Phase 2, Komenda, Anomabo, Cape Coast, Mensa Guinea, Ningo Pram Pram, New Takradi Phase 3, Apam, Kokrobite, Botiano, Blekusu Phase 2, and Abwazi Shama Phase 2, Maritime University, Nongwa, Takradi, Enyanui, and Isipon. Mr. Speaker, we're putting in place plans to avert the perennial flooding caused by the spillage of the Bagri Dam, which has resulted in the constant loss of lives and property over the years. In the short term, the salting of the White Volta will be undertaken this year, in conjunction with discussions with the Burkina Bays to regulate the flow of the spillage and mitigate its impact. The Minister of Works and Housing will, in the coming week, receive a report on the feasibility study conducted by the Chinese company Sinohydro for the construction of a dam at Pualugu to serve as a receptacle to hold the volume of water spilled from the Bakri Dam for irrigation purposes and also for the generation of electricity. This will be the permanent solution to the Bagri Dam problem. The requisite approvals will be sought by the Minister from Cabinet and Parliament to permit the beginning of the construction of the Pualugu Dam. Mr. Speaker, if there's been any government that has been on the side of persons with disabilities, it is my government. Yeah. We have increased the share of the District Assembly's Common Fund to persons with disabilities from 2% to 3%. And we have also ensured the implementation of our pledge of employing 50% of the persons who manage the country's toll booths from amongst persons with disabilities. That's how. Mr. Speaker, we're continuing with the initiative to improve the creative arts sector. We've also worked to finalize the Creative Arts Bill, leading to the setting up of the Creative Arts Fund. For the first time in 2018, the government provided support to the Creative Arts Council and the Creative Arts Masterclass to build capacity of creative arts practitioners has also commenced. The Eastern Regional Theatre has been completed and work is currently ongoing towards the construction of the Kumase Theatre. The Speaker, considering how often Ghana is in the news, usually for good reasons, we have not been able to attract as many visitors to our country as we should. We're making a special effort from now onwards to attract tourists into our country. Under the See Ghana, Eat Ghana, Wear Ghana, and Feel Ghana campaign, the Ghana Tourism Authority recorded a 20% growth since its launch to cover to over 600,000 visitations to various tourist sites. The World Bank has approved a $40 million grant to support the Tourism Ministry and its agencies to help upgrade tourist facilities. In September 2018, in Washington, D.C., in front of the Congressional Black Caucus of the United States Congress, I proclaimed 2019 as the year of return, commemorating the 400th anniversary 
of the arrival of the first 20 West African slaves in the Commonwealth of Virginia in what was to become the United States of America. We intend to use the symbolism of this year of return to bring together Africans, persons of African descent, and all well-wishers and lovers of freedom to strengthen the commitment to ensuring that the, bl the blots in our history, i.e. the transatlantic slave trade and slavery, never reoccur. In response to this proclamation, some 70 African-American Hollywood celebra celebrities visited Ghana over the Christmas in December 2018. The year-long campaign being coordinated by the Ghana Tourism Authority is expected to increase arrivals considerably. Training across the entire tourism sector is also receiving priority. The Hospitality Training Institute has been renovated and reopened in July 2018 to provide needed training in the hospitality and tourism sectors. Under Tourism Attractions Upgrade Project, several tourist sites, including Elmina Heritage Bay, Axim Fort St. Antonio, at St. Manson Slave River, Tetequashi Coco Farm, Bonsu Abertum, Kintampo Waterfalls are undergoing upgrades. A draft legislative instrument on sites and attractions is currently undergoing final stakeholder consultations. This will ensure world-class standards are set and maintained at all tourism sites and attractions. The speaker, the greatest attraction of our country is its people. Yes, we have castles and forts, we have waterfalls and dramatic mountain ranges, we have breathtaking beaches and historical sites that reduce visitors to strong emotions. But it is the people of Ghana and our welcome attitude that are the strongest attractions to visitors. We should never forget that we all have a responsibility to make visitors to our country feel welcome. In this year of return, when we have invited the world to visit, I would urge each one of us to make a special effort to make a visit to our country a memorable one. Our music, our foods, our clothes, and the quintessential Aquaba smile will make a visitor to our country come back again and again. Mr. Speaker, but there are things that many of us do that will put off any visitor from visiting our country, no matter how attractive the geography or the history might be. I refer especially to some of our sanitation habits. Mr. Speaker, public resources must be channeled into ventures that generate wealth and not spent on avoidable expenditures. The cost of clearing and cleaning up our cities and towns after those who litter has become prohibitive. The littering habit seems to be more predominant in the cities and urban areas and mercifully largely absent in the villages. Last year, I reiterated before you my pledge of improving sanitation in the country and making Accra the cleanest city in, Af in Africa by the end of my term. I said by the end of my term. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there has been a significant improvement in sanitation, even though I acknowledge more can be done. However, this is currently the state of play. We have witnessed an increase in the coverage of solid waste management from 16% to 53%. And over the course of last year, 35,862 household toilets were built, as opposed to 1,698 1, in 2016. 
will intensify our efforts at making Accra a clean city. In 2019, apart from continuing with educating and sensitizing people, we intend to use the bylaws to enforce cleanliness. The Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Sanitation are working together to try sanitation offices, offenses. People who litter would be tried and punished, and so would those who steal litter bins from our streets. We're launching a national sanitation brigade to help us carry this out. And through this vehicle, we will not only keep our towns and cities clean, but we will also provide jobs for our young people. Once waste is properly and efficiently managed, we can then explore how to use the waste collected to advance the economy of our nation. A costly look around our cities and towns will show us that plastic filth is our biggest problem. We intend to solve this problem through the internationally recognized priorities of waste, reduction first, followed by reuse, recycle, recovery, and lastly, disposal, which is to be avoided whenever possible. Government has prepared a plastics management policy with the overarching aim of meeting the challenges of comprehensive plastic management. About 82% of Ghana's plastic waste would be readily recovered and recycled with the existing technologies into value addition products in high demand locally and within the West African region. A vibrant recycling industry in Ghana could recover nearly one million tons of waste plastics from the environment and landfills annually to be recycled into basic need products valued at two billion CDs per year, creating many jobs across the economy. Currently, extensive discussions are being concluded with investors on the most sustainable options available to rid Ghana of this plastic filth menace. We're also tackling the problem of electronic waste head on. On August 20, 2018, I launched the National E-Waste Program to mark the commencement of two key provisions of the Hazardous and Electronic Waste Control and Management Act 917, Act 917. These provisions empower the external service provider, SGS, to verify, assess, and collect the advanced recycle echo fee on all electronic, electrical and electronic equipment from all exporting countries, and also to establish a state-of-the-art recycling facility at Agbobisi whose construction will begin in April. Not only will we solve the problem of waste disposal in an environmentally friendly manner, setting up the recycling facility will lead to the creation of over 20,000 direct jobs through the establishment of associated holding centers in each regional capital and collection centers in each district. Mr. Speaker, it is unfortunate that in 2019, will still have to revisit this topic. But open defecation cannot be a characteristic of a country that is working to be transformed economically and to be counted amongst the developed nations of the world. Emphataye. Esawo. That is why it is absolutely imperative that we make a success of our one house, one toilet policy. The community-led total sanitation program is being implemented in over 4,500 communities in 130 districts to achieve open defecation-free communities. And we must continue with that program. Mr. Speaker, affordable and reliable energy it's absolutely critical to realizing our vision of economic transformation. I'm happy to announce that gas production tripled during the year from 100 to 300 million cubic feet per day. The Ministry of Energy is undertaking steps to remove the transition bottlenecks, the transmission bottlenecks, to ensure that Ghanaian gas can reach power plants located in the eastern part of the country 
and I'm confident that by August this year, the situation would have been fully remedied to ensure Ghana uses locally produced gas for the bulk of its thermal power generation, saving substantial amounts of foreign exchange on imported fuels. Government is committed to achieving an electricity generation mix that ensures diversity and security of energy supply. For this reason, we will continue to promote the deployment of renewable energy in line with our policy target of 10% renewables in the energy mix from the current 1%. Another justification for renewable energy is that in spite of Ghana's excess electricity generation capacity, we can still not achieve our universal access target because there are many Ghanaian communities, especially those on islands and lakesides, that cannot be reached through the national grid. For example, there are currently 200 island and 2,000 lakeside communities that require mini grids from renewable sources to meet their energy needs. To reduce government's expenditure on utilities, and also promote the use of solar power for government and public buildings, the Ministry of Energy initiated the solar rooftop program. The ministry is leading by example with the installation of a 65 kilowatt solar rooftop system at its premises. Jubilee House, Mr. Speaker, will also be powered as from August this year by solar energy. as an example to other public institutions. In fact, Ghana's ta government's target is to install up to 200 megawatts of distributed solar power by 2030 in both residential and non-residential facilities in order to reduce government's liabilities to ECG PDS Ghana Limited. Renewable energy has also become a necessary addition to our energy sector because it has become increasingly cheaper and is key to the implementation of our international obligations under Sustainable Development Goal Number 7 on access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy, as well as Sustainable Development Goal 13 on urgent action to combat climate change. There's been good news, Mr. Speaker, with the recent announcement by ACCA Energy of one of the biggest oil finds in Africa. Mr. Speaker, this has led me to think that an MPP government must be good for Ghana. <laughs> it took an MPP government to discover oil in time, and not a single one was developed. The oil discovery in Africa. Enough, enough to make a believer of anyone, I might say. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there's no avoiding the fact that the oil industry, unfortunately, has lost our people, that we do not fall into the same trap of the oil money benefiting individual officials to the detriment of the state. And we've established a national register of contracts on which all the petroleum agreements signed by the government have been published. It's not called for contract transparency. We've also signed the general petroleum regulations, which provide for the disclosure of beneficial ownership information of companies operating in Ghana's oil and gas industry. This will ensure that people do not hide in the oil companies in Ghana has become dramatic, have signed petroleum exploration agreements with Ghana. Through the launch of the Ghana Oil and Gas Licensing Rounds of 2018, the other global players such as BP, China National Oil, Offshore Oil Corporation, and Toto have expressed interest in coming to Ghana. The speaker, be it in the oil industry or manufacturing or retail, every day demonstrates the urgent need for our own businesses to develop and flourish. We have put in place the mechanisms to train young entrepreneurs and to help establish businesses with a stimulus package to expand their companies. Under the Presidential Support Program, 
1,350 startups and small businesses have benefited from the special government business support program. Beneficiaries receive between 10,000 and 100,000 CDs each at a special interest rate of 10% instead of the average prevailing market rate of 26%. This is designed to help grow and expand their businesses and will create about 30,000 direct jobs. 18 systematic and coherent national support for startups and small businesses. Yeah. Yeah. And recreation, sanitation and waste management, health, food and beverages, green and ecological businesses, sports and real estate. Already established businesses are also receiving help with an amount of 230 million Ghana CDs being disbursed among 16 companies under the stimulus package. This has led to the creation of 8,000 rights and generating the right atmosphere to attract foreign business. It has come with the announcement that three major international automobile manufacturers, Volkswagen, Nissan, and Sinotrack, have signed MOUs to establish assembling plants in our country. Yeah. Renault is also conducting feasibility studies on establishing an assembly plant in Ghana, as is Toyota. We will outdoor in March the new automobile industry, which will also apply to indigenous car assembly companies, and many on a strong footing. The local textile industry is therefore being granted a zero-rated VAT on the supply of locally made textiles for a period of three years. We have put in place a tax stamp regime for both locally manufactured and imported textiles to address the challenge of pirated designs and logos in the textile trade. The Temaport has been designated as a single entry corridor for the importation of textile prints with a textile tax force in place to ensure effective compliance and reduce, if not wholly eliminate, smuggling of imported textiles. A new textile import management system has been instituted, also to control importations of textiles. This week, the one district, one factory policy has taken off. And 79 factories under the scheme are at various stages of operation or construction. Another 35 are going through credit approval. approval. All told, there's a lot of activity going on under the scheme, and it has awoken the interest of young people to go into manufacturing business. Under the Rural Enterprises Program, funded by the African Development Bank and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, 50 small-scale processing factories will be established by the end of the year in 50 districts across the country, particularly in areas where there's evidence of significant post-harvest losses. These will be owned and managed by organized youth groups with technical support from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. To speak up, small and medium-scale enterprises form the base of businesses in our country, and financing has been the bane of their operations. Maslow was established in 2006 to meet a critical need by providing the type of small-scale loans needed by these small-scale enterprises at reasonable rates. Sadly, Maslow was undermined by base political considerations and endemic corruption, and the center was almost run down completely. I'm glad to report that Maslow has been revamped and is getting back to do what it was set up to do. And there's been strict adherence to credit procedures and prudent management of the credit recovery process. These have resulted in a recovery rate of 89% of loans administered under a pilot scheme introduced in 2017. Maslock was given an amount of 35 million CDs in October 2008 to 18 for disbursement. This is the first time an amount of such magnitude has been given to the center outside of an election year. 
Of the 35 million Ghana CDs that were received, the centre has disbursed 20 million 563,100 Ghana CDs, with 14,317,200 CDs to be dispersed for pending applications which have been approved. So far, 87% of the monies disbursed have gone to women, to 24,582 women. The 2016 MPP manifesto promised to allocate 50% of mass lock funds to women, and we have surpassed this by a long margin. It has obviously been noticed that interesting things are happening at the 2019 budget. Such an amount is unprecedented in the history of vegetable farming, poultry, piggery, and fish farming. The Speaker, the incidence of bad government methods that almost collapsed mass law has unfortunately infected, affected the running of many businesses generally and the financial sector in particular. Mr. Speaker, the woes of the banking sector have also been a case of long-standing bad practices that was previously been able to deal with, which we are now having to deal with in the most painful manner. The cleanup has cost the National Treasury 12.7 billion CDs money for the people they employed. The banking sector has emerged stronger from these developments, has began to re-inspire confidence in this. In all this, not be issues to be made, sector, to have occurred in plain try to unravel the intricacies of what happened, work to bring a resolution to the matter, to the presidential financial stability to attract sharp figures. There has been food, and for the first time in a long while, we had more than we needed. It was not that long ago that Ghana was in the humiliating position of having to import maize from her landlocked Sahelian neighbors and plantain from Côte d'Ivoire. Thanks to the program for planting for food and jobs, admirably organized by that outstanding Minister for Agriculture, Dr. Urusu Efriye Akoto. This House stands informed that in 2018, exports of food crops such as cassava, rice, yellow and white maize, soya, plantain, cow pea, and yam were made from Ghana to Burkina Faso, Togo, and Côte d'Ivoire in considerable quantities. We had a bumper harvest of produce, and last year we did not import a single grain of maize. Based on the successes chalked in 2017 and then in 2018, the ministry took giant strides to scale up the planting for food and jobs campaign in 2019 and to introduce new models of the program. Four of such new models are the Greenhouse Villages Program, the Planting for Export and Rural Development PERD Program, the Rearing for Food and Jobs RFJ Campaign, and Mechanization Centers Program. We are hoping that the success will lead to a fundamental change in attitudes towards farming practices, and the sector will be truly transformed. Bumper harvest and increased food production in general will be the norm and not a surprise once in a while. Extension services will be extended and our farmers will have the confidence to know that theirs is a worthwhile business from which they can and will get healthy remuneration and respect. This year, Mr. Speaker, the, Mi the Ministry of Fisheries and Agri Agricultural Development plans to implement a flagship program, Aquaculture for Food and Jobs, AFP, complementary to the Planting for Food and Jobs Initiative to reinvigorate and boost the aquaculture industry. Priority will be given to youth entrepreneurs, distressed farmers, second cycle and in public institutions to set up and operate fish farms across the country. 
This program will offer participating individuals and groups the requisite inputs such as cages, fingerlings, fist feeding and training, fist feed and training to be able to establish their own farms. The FJ will be implemented for three years from 2019 to 2021 in collaboration with the Nation Builders Corps and the school feeding program. It is expected to create some 7,000 jobs and act an extra 33,628 metric tons of fish to our domestic fish production. Piloting of the AFG has already started at the James Camp Prison. For traditional fishing, government will collaborate with the private sector to facilitate the provision of 5,000 outward motors and 55,250 bales of prescribed fishing gears through the fisheries associations. To promote the effective and efficient distribution of premixed fuel, we will continue to use the premixed fuel tracking system and audit landing beaches measures, which have ensured that since November there has been no report of premixed diversion, a marked improvement from the past. To modernize the fisheries sector, $185 million of loan money has been earmarked for the construction of 12 landing sites and two fishing harbors in selected fishing communities in the country. Phase one will kick off in March at Axim, Mumford, Winneba, and Tessie. Recently, I cut the sword to commence work at the Jamestown Harbor Complex, which, like the development of Almina Fishing Harbor, is part of our plans for the fishing sector in 2019. Mr. Speaker, as is well known, our lands and water bodies have been under extreme pressure for some time. Farming lands have been destroyed, and rivers that used to provide safe drinking water and fish turned into toxic water bodies. This is why we placed the ban on all small-scale farming, so we could find ways to deal with the illegal mining, or galamse, as it is properly called. The ban, the ban on small-scale mining has now been lifted, but not on galamse. Some of our water bodies have shown remarkable signs of rejuvenation. River and Cobra, for example, looks restored to life. Indeed, some fish have even been seen in the Ancobra for the first time in a long while. But the battle against Galamse is nowhere near being won yet, and I appeal to all citizens to be part of the battle to keep our lands and water bodies safe. As I have said on several occasions, this government cannot be against mining. It bears repeating that with the Almighty having blessed our land with so many precious metal, minerals, mining inevitably will be part of our lives, which has remained effectively closed since 2014, in fulfillment of a campaign pledge I made to the people of Oboise on 15th. Mr. Speaker, and guarantee the stability of the project against changes in the legal environment, especially in the early years of the mines of balance between the interests of government and the investors. Under the new management of Anglo Gold Ashanti, the development of Oboise will reflect the wealth its soil produces, like its other counterparts in other mining cities around the world established an integrated aluminum industry in Ghana. The Ghana Integrated Aluminum Development Corporation has started an integrated aluminum industry. Since its formation, we have achieving and sent in partnering government to develop various components of the integrated industry. Agenda requires the uninterrupted and competitive supply of power to the industry. Government is in the process of negotiating. This arrangement is expected to be approved by cabinet and subsequently, hopefully, by parliament soon. The same model is being used for the exploitation of our iron ore deposits, which together with our considerable manganese deposits 
can enable us, can enable us fund this commission, which will allow prospective investors and partners to access every information regarding the bauxite deposits and the aluminum industry. The Minerals Commission is in the course of creating an equivalent data the forefront of keeping the work that they do. The Ghana Out, Concord Fist, Congon, Citadel, Ahojo, and Vanguard. Work is contributed in dealing with nomadic headsmen. The Ghana Armed Forces assisted the national security to embark on Operation Roadstar, and as a result of front planes reducing and reducing considerably the tense of the country. Government is pleased to fulfill this to five United States dollars to 35 United States dollars from 30 to 35 United States regularly at the operational areas. We will continue to modernize presenting to the Ghana Armed Forces 50 Ankai buses. The first tranche of the 130 will provide the Army with 30 Otoka armored personnel carriers and six fast patrol navy boats for the Navy. We'll also provide improved training facilities by transforming the military academy into a world-class institution and expand the housing project from six, 16 flats to 44 and begin. This year, we will also complete the project. Just speak up. There are men from 25 to 30 years, and the Associated Career Progression Plan has been reviewed, laid, and passed by Parliament, and will be implemented this year as planned. Just because it is the police that we, the ordinary citizens, have to deal with in our everyday lives. It is therefore not surprising that often the police come in for a lot of criticism for the, from the people. Speaker, as is the case with many, we have been busy this past year supplying the police with equipment, cars, motorbikes, drones, and other vital policing equipment. That is the first. Gradually, we're increasing the police numbers forward to a better trained, better equipped, and happier police if we're to abide by the rule of law. I'm aware of the frustration of many of the delays in the justice delivery system which are the results, to mention the barely concealed outrage of the Chief Justice as he's been going around examining the courts. It is obvious that most of the lower courts are not fit for purpose, and we must provide suitable structures for our law courts. Discussions on how to raise the money are... I'm pleased to know that there appears to have been a marked change in the Ministry of Justice. No longer do we have people bringing frivolous claims against the state because they know the case will not be defended and they will get judgment debts. I believe the, I believe the, world, is, the world is now out that every claim against the government will be vigorously defended and the state will no longer be the soft touch it used to be for people to get suspiciously large judgment debts awarded to them. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to state that, as you know, Parliament has virtually completed its deliberations on the Right to Information Bill, and that any moment from now, the nation will hear the news of its long-anticipated passage. I will happily assent to it as soon as it is brought to my table. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we all await the special prosecutor to start his work. It is in everybody's interest that we know that it is there. This should be an essential feature of the governance culture of our country. For myself, I know the special prosecutor to be a responsible public official who will act when he is ready. President of Africa, Ghana's voice is loud and clear on issues at international fora. Good neighborliness underpins our foreign policy, and we try to be at peace with all. I've been intimately involved in trying to find a resolution to the difficulties in our East inside and with the outside are critical for the modern existence of any nation. Our roads inside business has by now heard about the arrangements we have made with the Chinese company Sino Hydro, and it is a matter of great relief to me 
that I'm able to say that work will now be starting on the roads that have been designated to be part of that project. Yeah. It is worth stating that we are very much aware that there are many more roads that do not come under the Sino Hydro deal, which are also in a bad way, and we continue to seek ways to build a road network worthy of our nation. I'm glad, Mr. Speaker, to be able to report that the Accra to Tema Railway Service has started running on the refurbished line. The opening of the Accra and Swam line has been postponed because sand winners have undermined the ground underneath the track near Pokwasi. It is now being repaired and the service will start hopefully by the end of February. If we want the railways to work, we would all have to take an interest in and stop the activities of encroachers on the railway lands. The rehabilitation of the narrow aqua section of the Western Line, while work on the standard gauge section from Kojukrum to Mansu is ongoing. Apart from all the investments being made, the government is committing an extra one billion United States dollars to the development of the new railway network. $500 million will be applied to the development of the Western Line, and $500 million will be applied to the first of the Kumasi to Paga section of the national network. Yeah. The development of the Tema Wagadugu Railway Line is also progressing steadily. Twelve land acquisitions will commence beyond the Volta River at Mpakanai and the strategic investor will be selected. To sum it up, the railways are coming in a big way into Ghana, and we shall open up our country for the, for the development that we all desire. Mr. Speaker, government recognizes the significance of aviation to our country's economic and social development. Operations of the Kumase, Tamale, Takradi airports have been revamped with the resurgence in domestic airline operations, the flag of Ghana will be flown again as we have identified strategic investors to launch a home-based carrier. Yeah. Whilst we embark on the protracted process of building roads and railways to open up our country, we're doing so with modern technology is available in many places. There are 1,200,000 registered and verified addresses through the National Digital Property Addressing System. In other words, we've joined the modern world, gradually leaving the right turn at the blue kiosk and opposite the Kofi Brokeman cellar behind us. People are able to renew their national health insurance cards in minutes in the comfort of their own homes. You can now renew your, your driving license and register a car in half an hour, register your business online, and secure, acquire a passport in a week without any of the difficulties that used to come with trying to get any of these things done. The National Identification Card, the Ghana Card, has been issued to people in government departments and members of the security service, and this year the rest of the population will be registered and receive their cards. We're determined to join the digital world. Mr. Speaker, Ghana won last year the bid to host the 13 All-Africa Games. It presents our nation with the opportunity to upgrade sporting infrastructure in the country and position our nation as a preferred destination for the development of sporting disciplines on the continent. We began renovating and upgrading our sporting infrastructure, such as the Accra and Cape Coast Sports Stadia, and the Azuma Nelson Sports Complex in Kaneshi, and a complete refurbishment of sports facilities across the country. For, funds have also been released for the completion of the University of Ghana Sports Stadium, started by the Kufor-led MPP government, but abandoned soon after 2009. The Ghanaian people are also expectant of a return to normalcy of all football-related activities as soon as possible and the Normalization Committee is working to ensure that they meet the March deadline. Mr. Speaker, three months ago, 
a member of this honorable house and the representative of Ayawasu West constituency, West Wogan constituency, died suddenly, throwing all of us into mourning. On 31st January, three weeks ago, exa ago exactly, a by-election was called to elect a, rep a replacement for the late Emmanuel Chiramatein Ejako, may his soul rest in perfect peace. During the course of that morning, some events took place in that constituency which led to an uproar in the country. My first instinct was to let the police do their investigations and then prosecute if they found evidence of criminality. The narration that this was another incident of, quote, normal by election violence, unquote, caused me to expand my response. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, recent by-elections in Akwetia, Etiwa, Cheriponi, Tanansi, and Amenfi West have been marked with violence, and some people still have their physical and emotional scars to show for it. I could have sat it out, as some did for Akwetia, Etiwa, Cheriponi, Tanansi, and Amenfi West, but I decided that that will not be the interest of Ghanaian democracy. The time has come to put an end to the phenomenon of politically related violence. The only way in our system, the only way in our system to begin to deal with such a situation is through the work of a commission of inquiry. Thankfully, I got four responsible Ghanaians of independent spirit who agreed, who agreed to serve on the commission. I hope the findings and recommendations of the Indian Short Commission will enable us to chart a path to ending politically related violence in our country. The events of last Monday in Kumasi were a meeting of the National Regional Executives of the Opposition National Democratic Congress was broken up by acts of violence leading to the tragic death of a citizen have reinforced the urgent need for us to find that path. I want to use the platform of this message to make a sincere, passionate net appeal to the leaders of the two main political parties in our country, MPP and NDC, to come together as soon as possible, preferably next week, to agree on appropriate measures to bring an end to this worrying and unacceptable phenomenon of vigilantism in our body politics. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I have, last, I have asked I have asked the leadership of the MPP to extend an invitation to the, leaders, to the leadership of the NDC for such a meeting. The security services of the country will be on standby to assist this meeting. If voluntary disbandment by the parties is not feasible, then I will initiate legislation in the matter. Vigorous debate, vigorous debate, and the exchange of ideas should be the true basis of political dialogue and competition in our country, not the activities of party vigilante groups. The Speaker, what was tolerated over the years cannot and not, must not be accepted anymore. We must not take our peace and security for granted, not for a moment. Our children and grandchildren will not forgive us if we were to compromise our peace and stability. I will not permit that to happen under my watch. Our forebears pay too high a price with their blood and toil to bequeath to us this beautiful nation. And the lives of our citizens are too precious to waste. So, Mr. Speaker, let us come together. 
shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, and let us all be guided by the inspirational words of the second stanza of our national anthem. Hail to thy name, O Ghana. To thee we make our solemn bar, I know strength of arm, whether night or day, in the midst of storm. In <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we have our challenges, but our nation is in good health. I thank you for your attention. May God bless our nation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bless you. Honorable members, order. Honorable members, in accordance with our standing order 58, I wish to convey to His Excellency, the President of the Republic, the gratitude of this Honorable House. I seize this opportunity to express our appreciation to the Ghana Armed Forces, the various security agencies, and our own internal security for their services which have ensured the smooth success of this function. Honorable members, again, and in accordance with our practice, a formal communication will be extended to His Excellency the President, after this House has dutifully debated the address duly presented. I thank you very much for your cooperation and the extraordinary cool and collection. Yeah. Du duly assured me and which has been duly implemented. I thank you. Honorable Majority Leader, any indications at this stage? Speaker, the President has come to this house this morning in fulfillment of Article 67, which obligates him at the beginning of each session of Parliament and before a dissolution of Parliament to address Parliament on the message the state of the, of the nation. The Speaker, we have all seen the poise in the delivery, which is admirable and commendable. Yeah. Yeah. The content which we have all heard, we shall subject to scrutiny beginning next week, Tuesday. In that regard, and having exhausted the business of this day, Speaker, I would want to move that the House takes adjournment until tomorrow, 10 o'clock, in the forenoon. In the meantime, 
we shall see the presence of from the chamber. In the good company of my colleague, who I saw nodding in profuse appreciation of the present <laughs> I thank you, and I shall move. Honorable Minority Leader. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the President of the Republic and Commander in Chief have dutifully performed his duties as required of him in the Constitution. In this chamber, Mr. Speaker, as you yourself have observed, extraordinary conduct, the honor, the dignity of the president, let today mark the beginning of a rule of thumb that at all times, including when he will soon be succeeded, the same, the same respect, the same respect, will be accorded, <laughs> will be accorded, will be accorded. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, with those affordable houses uncompleted in whole, <laughs> and with the, ele with the elevation, <laughs> With the elevation of the suffering of Ghanaians to misery or prosperity, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you are reminded that the safety and security of Ghanaians remain paramount. With that assurance, with that assurance, with that assurance, we will look up to you dealing decisively, ruthlessly, and timely without any flower given to any partisan actor. I beg to second the motion. Honorable members, the motion for adjournment has been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. The eyes have it. And this honorable house will stand adjourned to tomorrow, 10 o'clock in the forenoon. Thank you very much.
Parliament. Uh, he has just finished delivering his 2019 State of the Nation address as prescribed by the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. Uh, the President of the Republic is expected to address Parliament at least once each year on the state of affairs in the country and that's what uh, President Ekufuado has just done in fulfillment of the constitutional provision. He spoke of a number of issues. Uh, he touched on almost all sectors and uh, the economy. He spoke to the issue of security and uh, as was anticipated by many of the persons we hear at GBC spoke to ahead of the delivery of the address. He touched on the issue of vigilantism. Uh, you may recall that vigilantism has become a, a, a matter of grave concern to many, many uh, persons, especially following uh, the incidents uh, right after the 2016 elections and when uh, President Ekufado himself was sworn in uh, to the events in uh, uh, during the Ayawaso West War gone by election and of course also what happened recently in Kumasi where one person was shot dead at the NDC office in uh, that part of the country. Uh, the president Kufado a while ago, we saw him um, signing the parliamentary album at the central lobby. Uh, his vice president Dr. Mahmoud Baumia to uh, make themselves available yeah. Within the last two years, uh, <laughs> Uh, who 